so I have the distinct pleasure and immense pressure of going last today. Yes, please laugh, it'll make me feel a little bit better. Okay. The French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre once said, freedom is what you do with what's been done to you. I think if we take this at face value, we'd be led to have the belief that we have to view all of our own actions and beliefs and perspectives antagonistically to everyone and everything else we interact with. But let's put a pin in that. Consider now the words of Justice Thurgood Marshall. None of us got where we are solely by pulling up our own bootstraps. We got here because a parent, a teacher, an Ivy League crony, or even a few nuns bent down and helped us pick up our boots. But why is this relevant? I think often we're taught to think of kindness in a moment first, as you never know what anybody else is going through at any given time. You never know what negative emotions they're dealing with. The person that just laid on their horn at us on Commonwealth or Storo Drive do so because they're rushing their pregnant spouse to the hospital? Are they late to get their child to a necessary doctor's appointment? Or perhaps even more importantly, did their elderly loved one fall and they're rushing to be with them or get them to the hospital? People deal with negative emotions every day for a variety of reasons, some which I think are incredibly difficult to discuss. Not just because they themselves have been wrong, like Sartre might have us believe, but because those that Marshall suggests are pivotal in our lives are the ones that are being wronged. For me, I struggle with these kind of emotions every day. Um, I think it affords me a unique perspective on self-forgiveness, one that I wanna share with you all today. But before I begin, I'd just like to say, self-forgiveness is not a uniform process. It doesn't look the same for everybody. It's not cookie cutter. I don't presume to speak for anyone or really everyone or anybody else other than me going through internal hardship, nor could I. But I do wanna share the principles I try to use when I look in the mirror and I get up every morning with you in the hopes that maybe they might help somebody else. So let me tell you a bit about myself. I'm adopted, quite happily, by an all-white family. I like to call my family all-American white. I was placed into foster care at the ripe old age of three months old. You see, my birth mother gave birth to me when I was three months, or three months premature. I weighed a whopping three pounds. I was quite literally this big. Does anybody here know what the term heteropaternal superfecundation means? Show of hands. There should be some hands over here because I have friends over here, but they don't count because they've heard this part before. <laughs> heteropaternal superfecundation refers to the process by which fraternal twins can be born with different, different birth fathers. A separate egg released during menstruation is fertilized in a separate intimate encounter 36 to 72 hours after the first encounter, or the first egg is fertilized. I only bring this up because I wasn't the only one born three months premature, so was my twin brother. No one knows how prevalent superfecundated twins are, right? It would require genetic testing of twins and under normal circumstances, who would think to do that? But there is a study that suggests that one in 400 twins or 0.25% of twins in the United States would be like my brother and me. Although now I've had the thought that I don't know if that means one in 400 twins, like one twin in 400 twins, or if it means one pair of twins in 400 pairs of twins. Maybe I guess it's the same math, but who knows? I, I'm not here to do math, so <laughs> I couldn't tell you. Anyway, obviously, because we were born three months premature, we had a number of health issues. My twin brother, was, uh, his lungs weren't working, and when I mean weren't working, they quite literally weren't inflating and deflating. He needed a, a metal lung to breathe and I was bleeding into my brain. Um, because of this, obviously we had a number of neonatal uh, doctor's appointments that we had to be sent to or taken to, and our birth mother wasn't doing that. So we were all taken away, and by all of us, I mean all of my birth siblings from my birth mother. I have nine birth siblings. My two older sisters, my minute older twin brother, which I'll never forgive him for, and my six younger siblings, which includes another set of twins. I will say, or I should say, originally, the judge presiding over our case, me and my twin brothers, made the determination that we weren't to be separated. But we were, for ver several reasons. That's just how the system works. But for various other life events and life occurrences, I haven't seen or spoken to my twin brother in the last seven years. I should also say that the judge initially ruled that I wasn't allowed to be adopted until I was four. So from the time I was three months old to the time I was four, I spent that time in foster care. Thankfully, my experience in foster care was great. It was with my family, my adopted family, the whole time. However, my earliest memory on this planet is because I had visitation. I had to go back and forth during that time between my house and my birth mother's house. My earliest memory on this planet is one where my older sister broke my hair, my mother's, hair dryer in the bathroom. 
leaving me there as like a three-year-old, a little toddler, obviously, I can run, leaving me in the bathroom with it. Her husband at the time, who was not my father, coming in, finding me, blaming me, grabbing me by my ankles and dangling me over a toilet, saying if I ever messed up, he didn't say messed up, but I'm not gonna repeat what he said. If I ever messed up again, he had no issue shoving me down the toilet and flushing me away because I was not his. I made mention that I had nine birth siblings and we all went into the system. Most of us were adopted. Some went to extended family. We have four fathers amongst the 10 of us, but all of us except for one, my next youngest sibling, Elijah. Elijah inspires a lot of the principles that I try to use every day, and I'll tell you why in a second. He was the only one of us that was never adopted, but he also spent the most time in the house with my birth mother and during visitation. He went from foster family to foster family and group home to group home before aging out of the system at 21. We're actually pretty close. He gave me a call this morning. I didn't pick up because I was a little nervous and wasn't sure quite what I wanted to say to him, so I have to call him right after this, but (laughs) anyway. He inspires a lot of those, a lot of these principles that I use on a regular basis, but so too does my birth father. I never had any relationship with my birth father until three years ago. You see, when I was four, right after I was adopted, he went to prison where he spent the next 17 years. He went to prison when he was 23, the same age I am now. I had a whole section of this talk that I was gonna talk about (laughs) last semester, the efforts I made to keep him out of prison, but I had to remove it because I found out three days ago that he's since back in prison. Before I get emotional, I'll keep going. (laughs) I studied the law here at Boston University. I'm a second year law student. Growing up, my parents, my family taught me to be creative and to to learn how to play instruments and sing. I performed at Carnegie Hall twice. I've sang at Disney World once. I played college lacrosse. I also played for the Puerto Rican national team and I worked for the Puerto Rican national team as the head of our island development, trying to bring lacrosse to as many kids and schools on the island as possible. I have a black belt in karate. I also published a book of poetry. Not to toot my own horn, but I think I'm pretty well adjusted. (laughs) But every day, I also deal with the thoughts that I'm not special, not at all. That I think my birth father, my brother Elijah, any of my birth siblings, or any of my cousins, other children that my parents had for long-term periods of time in foster care, could have done the most, if not more, with the opportunities that I've been afforded. I told you that my family is all American white. Let me explain why I say that. My father has a PhD in human genetics. He's responsible for some cancer research and the development of a number of marketed pharmaceutical drugs that you probably use in your bathroom every day. My mother is impressive in her own right. She's taught me the value of humanity and love in ways that I can really, really, really only hope to live up to. They have four of their own biological children, my four older siblings, who I like to say I've taken a bit of something from each one of them. Collectively, they consist of bear with me for a second, two high school All-Americans, a college All-American and CPA, a lawyer and wonderful mother in her own right, a successful businessman and restaurant owner in his own right, and here's the kicker, a NASA engineer and a US Olympic Taekwondo team alternate for the 2004 Olympics in Athens. That's the same person, the NASA engineer and the, (laughs) he's a seventh degree black belt in Taekwondo, just to name a few of their more impressive characteristics. My parents also adopted my little sister. She's now 19, she has autism, but despite of everything that she has to deal with on a regular basis, she's struggling to be and live independently. I'm surrounded by love and affection. I mean, truly surrounded. I like to say I'm enveloped by it. My mother loves to remind me I didn't grow under her heart, but I grew in it. But because of this, and I think because of the thoughts I've already said, I'm forced to kind of think about all of the other black and brown children that sit in the foster care system that will age out like my brother. You know, what could they make of themselves if they had been given the same access to resources, love, and affection like myself that I've been given? Not because I, you know, earned it, but because I was given them. I was afforded the privilege to have them. Like Justice Marshall says, somebody bent down and helped me pick up my boots. For me, feeling guilt about these opportunities, feeling guilt about these privileges that I have is most akin to the experience known as vicarious grief. First introduced by Robert Kastenbaum in 1987, Robert, observed it in elderly women who were expressing sorrow at the death of people that they did not know. In 2003, researcher Rando expanded on vicarious grief, saying that it was real grief, yes, but there were two types. The first is the bereaver, or sorry, the griever experiencing what it must be like for the bereaved, and the second was a uh, compounding effect of vicarious grief and own, your own um, grief being expressed, meaning, because that didn't make sense to me when I first read it either, that 
the griever was experiencing what it must be like for the bereaved and experiencing their own personal losses at the same time. So let me tell you a little bit about how I deal with this guilt or what I will call as vicarious guilt, vicarious grief. These three principles every day. One, control the controllables. I tell myself this when I look in the mirror, I tell the kids I coach, I tell the kids I tutor, control the controllables. I think for me, to give you an example, it looks a lot, a lot like, can I change what has happened to my brother? Can I change what has happened to my father? I can't. I wish I could, but I can't. And so instead of letting it rule me or ruin my life, so to speak, I let it go. Not that I would forget about it, but I don't let it control me. To give you a, little, a few sillier examples, I'm sure we all know or remember a time when we told a joke around the water cooler at work or in class and nobody laughed with us, they laughed at us. It makes us anxious, it makes us upset, right? Or we remember that time that we asked out so-and-so, maybe to prom, maybe to a dance, maybe just on a date, and they laugh in our face instead of saying politely no, or what we really wanted to hear, yes. <laughs> so I say these things happened in the past, correct? but we can't change what happened or that they happened, and we shouldn't let them rule our lives in the present. This is also true for things that are happening currently. Control the controllables. If you can change what something is happening to you or that something is happening to you in the present, do so if it's feasible, but if you can't, don't let it control you. Don't let it ruin your life. Control the controllables. Obviously, this is very hard to do with respect to grief and trauma, but I still think it's true. Control the controllables. Two, if we can apologize to others, we can apologize to ourselves. I think in our society, we are taught often that we should apologize when we have done something wrong, and even when we haven't done anything wrong. I think apologies are just a part of the way we exist, we function. But if we can get comfortable apologizing to other people, even when it's not warranted, we should be equally as comfortable apologizing to ourselves. I don't necessarily mean telling yourself I'm sorry, but I mean telling yourself it's okay. It's okay you had to cancel those plans because you're processing, you're dealing with something. It's okay you had to you know, skip class because you just couldn't get out of bed today. It's okay you had to take a break. It's okay you had to take a nap. It's okay you had to take a breath. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Three, never apologize for being when you need to just be. This is a little bit different than the last one, so bear with me. But like I just said, I encourage you all to apologize to yourselves when it's warranted and when you need to but you should never have to apologize to somebody else for doing what you need to do to just be, to get by, to exist, to get through the day. You know, self-forgiveness for me looks like, you know, sometimes I do need to just take a step back and think and sort of rid myself of the pressure I put on myself because of this guilt that I feel. And so sometimes, it, you know, I have to take a break, I have to take a nap, I have to skip a class. And I'm never going to apologize to somebody else for doing so. I might say, you know, it's okay that I did it to myself, but I'm never going to apologize to somebody else for having to take a moment, take a step back, take a second to just exist. Now I said these are three principles, and this is true, but each one actually has two parts, so technically it's more like six. Each one has an active and a passive part. The active part is using them, recognizing when to use them and employing them, sure. And the passive part is, you know, realizing that sometimes it's not acceptable to use them, sometimes it's not a good reason, sometimes whatever. Right? But it's a passive part of understanding when they are truly applicable and then the active part of using them. I'm not the only one to talk about dealing with grief and bereavement. There's been a number of studies, there's been a number of research done, so I'll tell you about one other study. Margaret Strobe and Hank Schutt, their process is called the dual process model, in which they illuminate what they call adaptive coping, recognizing active and passive stressors of grief and confronting and avoiding those same tasks of grieving. I think it sounds a little bit familiar. I think it sounds a little bit like my model, right? Because we adopt some of the same similar themes. The idea that all the situations we face and everything we want to overcome requires an active facing of that situation and also a passive understanding that you cannot and will not be over your grief or trauma overnight. Our healing canvas is ourselves, right? And how we paint on it, I think deliberately, carefully, and with an understanding or acknowledgement of the coexisting fragility and resiliency of the brushes we use, those brushes being our minds, ourselves, is how we can heal and move forward. If Sartre says, freedom is what you do with what's been done to you or been done to us, then how we heal is what we do with what we have as we recognize where we are coming from and where we want to go. Thank you. <laughs>